So um, this is a, a group of people who have been working, uh, working with me over the years. And uh, my longest uh, collaboration here is with Dennis Miller. He's a, a chemical engineer at Michigan State. Uh, we, we go back to the uh, very beginning of the 90s where we started looking at um, yeah, small molecule uh, biogenic uh, feedstocks for catalytic conversions, and I'll mention some of that. But then these are all uh, graduate students and, and postdocs who have worked uh, with us, and later on Chris Safran, who's in ag engineering and, and uh, uh, natural resources, uh, joined our effort. Uh, and then the people who are in red here are the current uh, lab members, these in my own group and, and those in, the, in those two guys' groups too. I always like to put that up first because, of course, people go to sleep by the end. So, um, so uh, you know, if you want to leave now, this is the story. Okay, this is this is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you why I think that the right strategy is to uh, is to take the middle ground uh, in taking biomass and trying to transform it into uh, useful target substances and. I will also admit that by far my, my uh, highest priority in this conversation is focusing on liquid products, especially, especially liquid energy substances, fuels, but also uh, the potential to make you know, chemically valuable things. And so this is the whole story, and you know, these are just pictures to make it, uh, to illustrate it. But the idea is that we, we think that the best way to make all of the uh, carbon in biomass available is to use uh, fast pyrolysis methods as opposed to um, more sophisticated but also more complex uh, biological methods or uh, more expensive and a little bit more completely uh, disassembling, uh, you know, uh, gasification and uh, fischer tropsch Those are the two sort of extremes, one at the high energy end, one, the other at the uh, biological sophistication end. Uh, we're too dumb for both of those. Um, so the, that's the middle ground. And, uh, and then the other half of the story is that we have come to the conclusion that, that not just uh, upgrading, but upgrading with energy incorporation uh, from electricity will turn out to be important. And so that's uh, electrocatalytic hydrogenation. And those are the directions that we're going to focus on. Now, of course, uh, there is a whole infrastructure in place that uses uh, a lot of very, very sophisticated chemistry to uh, develop and extract uh, the value from co collections of hydrocarbons. And so some of these oils that we think that we'll be generating from uh, biomass starting points could well end up being shipped off to a, a more or less classical uh, set of conversions that one would be able to do, that one can do today in a petroleum refinery. <clears throat> Uh, so my comment here is that this, inf this infrastructure, these tools, will still be needed for a long time. Okay, why do we care about this? Um, well, uh, it's my belief that hydrocarbons are not something we're going to be able to get away from, and I'll tell you a little bit why, uh, more why I believe that in a little while. Um, they're energy dense, they're safe, we're used to using them. Uh, they're also the foundation for our chemical industries, uh, and we're used to, we know how to build our uh, uh, current um, collections of monomers for polymers and so forth uh, from those things. Not that we shouldn't be trying to get away from those in the longer run, uh, perhaps overall, but uh, a lot of these building blocks work perfectly well, and the strike against them is simply that they uh, come from uh, fossil sources. So the other uh, familiar argument, of course, is that fossil inputs, fossil petroleum comes from uh, countries we don't necessarily uh, agree with in all ways. And um, another aspect that I think is going to be very important is how do we envision a, a scheme that will work even for, um, I'm going to take this very hot coat off, um, even for uh, a biomass that comes from a very diverse collection of locations, that is to say, you got to drive an awful lot of vehicle miles to go out and gather up all the corn stover and so forth. These are obvious issues, but, but I think that they're, they're points that have to be uh, considered in any vision. The last part is uh, to efficiently use the carbon that plants have fixed. And one of, part of my thesis here is to, uh, or my work here, is to highlight the importance of paying attention to that issue. So this is just to draw on people from MSU who have uh, made important comments to guide us 
One of them you might know, uh, and he simply points out that you know, the things that we want to accomplish here require not just saying, oh, we know how to do these things, let's just string together a bunch of operations we know and, and do them. It's not that. It's going to take a lot of creativity, a lot of uh, curiosity-driven research uh, to, to solve these problems. I, I'm slightly dismayed to notice that he doesn't highlight, where's chemistry in there? But so I drew on another old MSU uh, colleague, uh, uh, Dan Osera, who of course is at MIT, who has uh, just written a very nice article summarizing uh, strategies for, in particular, storing solar energy. Uh, and he also highlights the importance of uh, fundamental new scientific exploration. But here are the critiques of what is obviously, uh, in, you know, in some ways, uh, the gambit that I'm outlining. What's the problem? What, you know, why do I focus on liquids? Can't we just, you know, for example, burn biomass and use the energy that way and not worry about doing all of this fancy uh, manipulation? Why am I committed to pyrolysis versus, for example, hydrolysis and biological transformation or gasification and uh, fissure trope sy synthesis to make uh, diesel, for example? Why do we care about upgrading locally? I just pretty much explained that to you, but we'll see some chemical reasons as well. Um, why do I think electrolysis is going to matter? Right now, when we buy, f buy electricity, it comes from fuels being burnt. So why am I talking about making fuels from electricity? And then finally, of course, the usual question, which is, isn't this too hard? Shouldn't we just close our eyes and buy more stuff? Well, uh, and here's some of the stuff you can buy, and that's part of the problem. You know, the stuff you can buy really all comes from, or at least a significant fraction of it comes from, uh, chemical technologies, but importantly, good grief, these all came out pretty dark, didn't they? But anyway, uh, the chemical technologies uh, pretty much all start with, perhaps with the exception of construction materials, they pretty much all start with petroleum. Medicines, plastics, electronics, fibers and fabrics, all these things, paints and coatings, these things pretty much all start with petroleum. So we really need this stuff. So let's just take a closer look at, at what we know about uh, today's way, uh, ways of using petroleum and kind of also the orders of magnitude of, of challenge that we're looking at. There's no way I can turn around, is there? <laughs> so <clears throat> today's oil usage is, is staggering. These are numbers well beyond a human's capacity to comprehend. You know, 19 million barrels of oil a day, and a barrel is not a small thing. So uh, also, we want to highlight, the, the, as usual, the fact that uh, it, significantly more than half of the crude that we, uh, that we uh, refine in the United States is imported. Um, most of it, of course, from countries that we're, first of all, right next to, and second of all, pretty peaceful with. But almost 40% come from areas that we uh, that are politically uh, perhaps a little bit un unstable. Um, about two thirds of it, or, or three quarters, is uh, refined into liquid fuels for transportation. A fairly crude use for such a such a, a valuable resource, but uh, but we need these things. Um, when we burn these fuels, they they create about a third of the. Uh, uh, fossil carbon-based CO2 that we produce uh, in the world. We, as the United States, produce about one-fifth of all the CO2 that's being produced uh, with only 300 million of the, how are, we, how are we up to 7 billion people on the planet now? Uh, that's a little bit greedy, but anyway. Um, our own reserves, this is another thing that uh, is perhaps not uh, focused on as often as possible, as, as, Necessary. If we simply were cut off from the world and the United States had to supply its own, had to use its own oil uh, at the rate that we're currently using it, we have of known reserves of really less than four years worth. And that count, counts the Anwar Reserve, that counts uh, offshore sources that, that the US controls. Um, that ain't much. <laughs> I, I point this out just to highlight the urgency of. Uh, of our needing to know how to deal with this problem. And so then we can ask, you know, can we live without what petroleum gives us? Probably not, we're pretty used to it. Uh, also, how, how can chemistry make this uh, a move to a renewable uh, basis possible? Why do, we, uh, why do we worry about these things? Isn't, I mean, oil's been flowing for 150 years, isn't, uh, isn't this no big deal? Um, well, 
just this month, just this month, the forecast jumped by 50 cents for the price of gasoline. So between, this is the forecast that was made uh, in, in February uh, versus the forecast that was made in March for the price of gasoline um, you know, going forward. And here you see a 50%, uh, sorry, a 50 cent change, not quite 50%, but still a rather large jump. Um, that's not what you'd call stable. <laughs> Of course, it reflects some, some recent, especially troubling uh, events in the world that it doesn't happen every month, but still. This is the most familiar uh, call to action, the Keeling curve of carbon dioxide slowly growing in the atmosphere. We're up to, uh, in February, 391 parts per million. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I teach in my freshman chemistry class, and I know that some of these things are, are old hat for you, but um, a lot of freshmen, a lot of people who go home from college and they tell their parents, you know, the CO2 thing, it's really scary. It's a big deal. And somebody has a common sense, you know, parent or uncle or something who says, look, you know, come on, 390 parts per million is a, is a minuscule quantity. How could it possibly matter? And this is the place where knowing some chemistry actually matters. The issue is not that carbon dioxide is the bad guy. The issue is that oxygen and nitrogen are uniquely, almost absolutely uniquely, the good guys. These are two of roughly you know, five or six chemical substances that are available, sort of routinely available to us in the world that are not capable of absorbing infrared light uh, because they are homonuclear diatomics. You can stretch them all you like, they won't change their uh, dipole, and therefore they can't interact with the oscillating electric field of infrared light as it goes by. And so it's not so much that CO2 is particularly good or particularly you know, evil as, a, as an infrared absorber, it's that O2 and N2 are particularly transparent. That means we should think of the ozone layer, or sorry, the uh, uh, global warming problem, the, the uh, greenhouse gas problem as one in which we're picturing a bucket of absolutely clear water and then saying, what happens if I take one drop of food coloring and drop it in that water? It'll make all the water just a little bit pink. But if I put a second drop in, it'll be twice as pink. And that's the important point, that it's starting from a transparent point. The other thing is, of course, every other molecule that isn't a homonuclear diatomic, and the other ones would never be in the atmosphere, let's hope, chlorine, bromine, iodine, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, fluorine, uh, you know, uh, any other molecule that's going to be up there, oh, I didn't mention argon, argon is in the atmosphere, that's the one mononuclear gas, but of course that's, that's uh, also very rare. Um, but any other molecule that's going to be in the atmosphere is a greenhouse substance. But there's a little bit of reason for optimism, and these also are familiar things. This is carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane. These things are all growing, and they're all greenhouse gases. But here are the freons, freon 12 and freon 11. And what I've got up here, these numbers are the so-called global warming potential, the ability of these gases to contribute to atmospheric warming. Uh, and what's interesting in these plots, in my opinion, is the fact that these two curves stop. They stop growing. And why? Because in uh, 1970, uh, sorry, 1990, uh, uh, in Montreal, it was decided, not because of global warming, but because of the ozone layer, that we would stop producing the freons. And the freons are particularly powerful greenhouse gases. I mean, after all, their principal uh, function in the market is as refrigerant gases, gases that absorb and, and release heat. Uh, in refrigerators and air conditioners. So in the overall scheme of the growth of radiative forcing, that is to say the ability of gases in the atmosphere to warm, to, to preserve heat in the atmosphere, uh, you see a slight uh, inflection point where uh, in 1990 where we, we quit uh, putting up freons and instead of continuing to grow, the yellow and the blue plots, which are the two freons, stopped growing and are now uh, dropping off. The other thing, though, that's startling is this is a parts per trillion plot. This is a parts per million plot. But 
their global warming potential is so huge because they're such powerful uh, thermal energy transfer gases that uh, they still contribute non-trivially to the overall burden of, uh, of uh, radiative forcing. And so it, it's actually, uh, the reason I say it's a reason for hope is simply when humans choose, choose to change, it makes a difference. All right, well, so this is the feel-good stuff. Uh, what, you know, what should we do? How are we going to get away from this? We've got to stop uh, using fossil resources and go to renewable biomass instead of fossil oil. And you know, I, the big three questions in my mind are, you know, if we really want to move in this direction, what can we learn from the, the lessons of the past? What are the things that we're already doing that we, that we should keep on doing uh, on, on the scales and uh, level of sophistication that we do with petroleum refining? What new science do we need to, to, do to, to develop to move forward? And then where are the places, where are the sort of ideal starting points? If we want to move to a biomass basis for uh, a modern chemical and, and energy industry, um, where do we start? Uh, and this is just uh, to remind you of all of the wonderful ideals of green chemistry. This is the other good, feel good part. You know, wow, if we work with biomass, we're going to be uh, uh, not, not only uh, not using fossil carbon, but hopefully working with things that are a little bit less toxic than the things that come out of the ground, out of oil wells. Uh, we want to follow the ideals of green chemistry by doing atom economical uh, uh, transformations, which means, uh, for example, catalysis, not using reagents that have a lot of uh, byproducts, not using organic solvents, et cetera. Oh, and I should just say, I, that last met, uh, note I, met, I should have mentioned, I, I view uh, you know, any actual vision of the biomass uh, uh, refinery as being a partnership between biocatalysis and, and chemical transformation. I'm not a, somebody who thinks that we're going to find a way to take, grind up trees and put them in something that looks like a petroleum refinery, but I'm also not somebody who thinks it's all going to come down to putting it in the fermenter and teaching the bugs to make, you know, polyvinyl chloride pipes for us. Uh, so we, it's going to be a partnership. So let's just compare the, you know, the kinds of feedstocks, the kinds of inputs that we're looking at. You know, hydrocarbons, of course, are uh, highly reduced. They're hydrophobic, volatile, thermally stable. Uh, they come from crude oil. Uh, whereas, of course, uh, for biomass, the, the, uh, these things are much more polar, oxygenated, not volatile. Um, and importantly, the energy content of hydrocarbons is about three times, on a mass basis, three times as great as the energy content of, uh, of biomass. Um, so there's something else I was going to say about this, but anyway. Uh, oh, yeah, basically, you know, the, the difference here is essentially like the difference between oil and water, of course. You've got all these OH groups on the outside of your biomass. So let's go back and look at the numbers again. I know we already looked at one huge slide of text about oil, but we got to come back to this because this is really important. And I know I'm pr almost certainly preaching to the choir in a place like this, but I've been, I'm at a big agricultural school that talks about plants and their values and what they can become a lot. And I've met a lot of people who haven't taken the time to contemplate these kinds of numbers on the scale. So if you don't mind, I just want to go through these even if it's a totally old hat for you. So we use 19 million barrels of oil a day. That translates into almost 1 billion tons of petroleum a year in the United States. Uh, I don't care so much about the money right now, but let's talk about the carbon. Most hydrocarbons are, if you basically think of an alkane, you've got uh, something with the formula CH2 approximately. So that's 12 mass units out of 14 uh, that are carbon, so that's more or less 86 percent. Uh, aromatics are even a little bit more carbon filled, so or made up of carbon. So roughly, we've got our, our 1 billion tons approximately, and we've got about 85 percent of them as carbon. Uh, let's call that 800 million tons of carbon in petroleum that we produce and use uh, each year. In terms of energy content, you can go through the exercise, and I don't even know what the prefix is for 10 to the 18th. What is it? Let's see. Hecta, hecta. There's peta. That's below. That's 15, right? Peta is 15. What's that? It's hecta, E-C-T-A. Anyway, 10 to the 18. <laughs> that's a heck of a lot of joules. Uh, uh, this is the energy that we, we're getting from uh, our liquid uh, 
petroleum input. <coughs> but I make this an evolutionary point right here. And again, this is obvious, especially for people trained in biological thinking who are used to thinking about how different organisms compare. But I'd just like to point out something, which is that the compactness, the energy density of hydrocarbons is echoed in the fact that we ourselves, especially me today, um, are carrying around a very concentrated energy source, which is called fat. Um, and that is basically hydrocarbon, you know, plus a few oxygens to kind of help us hold things together and, and uh, manipulate the, the molecules. But basically, we store uh, the majority of our spare energy in fat. Why? Because, not just because it's uh, uh, chemically convenient, in fact, it's chemically quite a bit of work to do all that reduction of uh, carbon in our food, the, in the form we get it in in food, down to uh, hydrocarbon. The point is, it's a very compact way of, uh, of carrying around a lot of energy. And when you think about plants, so I, this, I was asking Joe about hummingbirds today. Uh, in, in mobile organisms, we care about how much our energy, energy reserves weigh. Trees don't. Trees don't have to move around. But if I have to run from a cheetah, I'm a lot better carrying around all the megajoules I have on me. Not that I would make it away from a cheetah. but. Uh, uh, in this kind of dense uh, uh, material than I would be if I were carrying around uh, a lot of, uh, of sugar or, or something less energy dense. And by the way, ATP on a mass basis is very, very energy dilute. ATP, we think of it as the high energy molecule, but it's not, not on a mass basis. Uh, anyway, so mass matters for mobile life. And down here I say including vehicles. This ultimately is the explanation for why I say in the long run, we still need to target hydrocarbons as our, uh, as our goal when we, kind of, when we talk about liquid fuels and so forth. Did I skip two? OK, now, the, the analogous uh, discussion for biomass uh, is uh, pretty straightforward. A few years ago, the DOE uh, put together a, a publication called The Billion Ton Vision, or sometimes called The Billion Ton Study, um, and they identified a little over a billion tons of harvestable biomass that, that, that could be recovered without uh, you know, a net uh, destruction of, for example, forest, land, and so forth. Uh, more recently, people have suggested that, that number could be a little higher, more like one and a half billion. Let's call it one and a half billion. That sounds good. Wow, one and a half billion? I said only 800 million uh, tons of carbon in our, in our petroleum. This sounds like we're going to solve the problem with biomass, right? Well, it's not that easy because the carbon content of biomass is a whole lot lower. The trouble is if we say the average formula is approximately uh, like a carbohydrate, then that oxygen weighs a lot and the carbon uh, component of biomass is only about 40%. All right, we can be a little bit more generous because the lignans have some aromatics. Let's call it 45%, but it's a whole lot lower than the 90% than the or so, 85 to 90, that we uh, identified for uh, hydrocarbons. And so, uh, the other thing is that getting liquids out of a biomass, whether it's by fermentations, liquid fuels, uh, or by biomass fast pyrolysis, which I'll come back to, uh, all of those things are, uh, are, have, have yields that are not uh, particularly uh, quantitative. And so I think 70% is a, actually a fairly generous estimate of the amount that actually is transformed from solid biomass to uh, usable liquids. And so if we uh, go through that calculation and we say how much carbon ends up in our usable uh, biomass derived uh, materials, we end up with a half a billion tons. Let's see, we had 800 million tons of carbon just in the petroleum we bought. We haven't even talked about the chemistry we have to do to transform the biomass into all the other things we'd like to make. And we're already uh, almost half, uh, you know, at, at almost half uh, the, the carbon too low to match uh, what petroleum brings us. Furthermore, when you go to the energy content, it's even worse. We said it was 40 for uh, petroleum. Now it's only 17 uh, exa. It's exa with an X. Exajoules, right, uh, uh, for biomass. Another thing that should be pointed out is that when fuels are too dilute in terms of their energy content, you can't extract as much mechanical energy. If you, if you burn the same amount of, uh, if you release the same amount of uh, you know, kilocalories uh, 
by burning logs as you do by burning carp, uh, uh, coal, you can get a lot more mechanical energy uh, out of the coal than you could out of the logs because of the, yeah, the, the temperature differences between the cold end and the hot end in terms of, you know, for example, a, a piston engine like a steam engine or something. These are uh, fundamental thermodynamic limits. So this one third megajoule per kilogram uh, energy content compared to uh, petroleum is, is actually worse than just one third. So that's our problem. We don't have enough carbon and we really don't have enough energy in the biomass. Uh, biomass brings less than half the energy we get in the petroleum and again that isn't even taking into account whatever transformation chemistry we have to do to it. So let's take a look at the consequence of those numbers that I just went through and as I said I apologize if, if all of that was totally obvious to you which it probably was. Um, these, uh, these two boundary conditions that we've just gone through ultimately make one worry a great deal about strategies that start with biomass and simply say let's concentrate the energy content of the biomass into some set of liquid fuels because we're starting with something that's energy dilute. We're doing chemistry like for example glucose to ethanol. We're doing chemistry that throws away a third of the carbon. Wait, we already said we don't have enough carbon to begin with and now we're throwing away a third of it and we don't have enough energy and so, and furthermore, ethanol is not a drop in replacement for gasoline. Ethanol, of course, doesn't have the same energy density as gasoline. So uh, to uh, replace hydrocarbons, we would actually need more than an equal amount of ethanol uh, if we were going to use ethanol. Um, so the point is that biomass-based strategies, strategies based on biomass energy alone uh, to replace uh, our petroleum usage are more or less I hate to use this word, but I really mean it, doomed, to a limited role. Let's put it that way. I don't mean they're doomed, they're not worth doing. I just mean that they're not going to solve the whole problem. Well, we've still got the carbon problem, but the obvious thing is to note that the overall scheme that we're talking about when we really step back and say, what are we doing if we're using plants to uh, make energy materials, what we're really doing is we're capturing solar energy and making it into our fuels and so forth. If that's true, um, you know, we have to understand this as a solar energy capture scheme. Um, if we want to make practical liquid fuels, that is to say hydrocarbons, we also need a carbon capture scheme. Uh, and uh, we've talked about the carbon contents of biomass. Um, let's look at what plants and what humans are good at. Plants are actually very bad at capturing solar energy. We just said we're using a solar energy capture scheme to, uh, to capture the energy that we want. We're trying to transform solar energy and we're using something that drops the solar energy's contribution by two orders of magnitude in the very first step. That just doesn't sound like very good economics. Uh, on the other hand, if I go down to my local children's museum and I buy a toy that has a solar panel on it, a little solar panel on it, that thing's already you know, getting numbers that are approaching 10% efficiency for old, old uh, single crystal silicon technology. And I have several rather intelligent colleagues, and I, there, I know there are many in places like this, uh, who are, you know, talking about staggering numbers as high as, say, 40% for uh, the potential for photovoltaic um, energy capture. So humans actually are a lot better at, than plants are at capturing solar energy. Ah, but there's a, there's a rub here, and that is that that energy is in the form of electrical power. On the other hand, carbons are by far the best thing we know for capturing carbon out of the atmosphere. There's a lot of talk about methods for transforming CO2, doing chemistry to, uh, to uh, take CO2 and make it into a building block, but capturing CO2 out of 390 parts per million air is uh, an awful lot of work against entropy. and. Uh, uh, I don't know of any serious human technology that's trying. Is anybody doing anything here along these lines? From air itself, not from, you know, exhaust gases. Directly from air. How, what's the strategy?
Yeah, well, and then the, the issue is always a sense, usually, is what's the energy you had to invest to build this device, and then what, what are its maintenance costs as you go along? Anyway, I mean, of course, every freshman who's done chemistry in the lab knows how to capture CO2, because we were taught that if we didn't leave, put the cork on top of the uh, titration uh, uh, burette, we would end up ruining our sodium hydroxide solutions, because that would capture CO2 out of the room. Um, but but we had to pay for that sodium hydroxide with petroleum <laughs> a long time before. Um, anyway, so my argument is basically let's let plants do what they do best, capture, en capture carbon from this very dilute supply. Let's let humans do what we do better, that's capture the energy from sunlight, and then now the trick is to figure out how to put these things together. And of course, we'd like as much as possible to use methods that are, that are uh, simple and general, um, and ideally uh, things that one can implement uh, broadly without, uh, without having to centralize, build centralized facilities. So we're back to this uh, pyrolysis as our first uh, step in transformation. What does pyrolysis do? It, it uh, represents thermal decomposition of ground up biomass, uh, typically in the range of four, four, five, six hundred degrees. Uh, and it takes uh, solid uh, particulate stuff. It doesn't have to be terribly uh, small, chopped up terribly small, uh, into a rather disgusting black gooey stuff called bio oil, uh, one of my least favorite terms for it, by the way, uh, because it sounds like it comes out of uh, animals or plants or something, but it, but it actually is coming out of a thermal transformation. Anyway, commonly known as bio oil. It does, uh, it's not perfect. It's, it, this is our 70% that I invoked before. Uh, you get a certain amount of char, and you get a certain amount of gas. and uh, these things have, uh, have uses one can think of, but they don't represent uh, pathways to liquid fuels. Um, the good thing about it is that it's a relatively simple thing to do, and it's completely general. You can do it to any old biomass you like. The downside is we don't know that much in detail about the chemical processes that happen in pyrolysis. And also, uh, upgrading the bio oil is, uh, is itself a challenge, because this is a complex mixture with literally thousands of compounds in it. Uh, this is the toy that most people studying these subject, subjects work with. It's called a pyroprobe GC mass spec. It, what it boils down to is something that looks not unlike a light bulb uh, into which one puts a, uh, a very small quartz tube with less than a milligram of material. Um, you heat it up very rapidly. Uh, with helium gas sweeping through, and then send it off to the GC mass spec for uh, analysis. This is a, a, oh wow, very dark, sorry. My screen is much lighter than this. Uh, anyway, this is a, a, an approximate uh, account of the bits and pieces that uh, one gets in bio oil. And the main thing is that you can notice how complex the mixture is. Aldehydes, phenols, guaiacol, that, stands, that says guaiacol, that's uh, other categories of phenols, syringols, guaiacols, and phenols are all uh, lignin uh, derived starting material or uh, uh, small molecules. Uh, sugars, what does that say? Uh, furans, it says, miscellaneous oxygenates, et cetera. And acid, there's a lot of acid, a lot of acetic acid especially, but other acids as well. Phenols are, of course, somewhat acidic. So it's a bit of a mess. Um, and here's an example from our own pyrolysis setup. This happens to be, of course, one of, uh, one of the relatively famous energy crops, switchgrass. Uh, and I apologize for the, for the toothiness of this, uh, GC mat, of this uh, GC trace. But what you can see is uh, methyl glyoxyl, hydroxyaldehyde. You can see all these, these things in green are, are compounds that we think of as coming from breakdown of carbohydrates. And then uh, the compounds listed in red are things that we uh, think of as, as coming from breakdown of the lignins uh, in the switchgrass. And here's levoglucosan. Uh, this particular peak isn't very big, but levoglucosan is glucose minus water. Uh, levoglucosan act as a small single molecule compound is actually something of, of substantial interest for people who do want to take glucose and go do chemistry with it. Anyway, you can see it's kind of a mess. Uh, here are some of the acknowledged pathways in this overall uh, process just to give some of these small molecule things. And I'm not going to harangue you with organic uh, reaction mechanisms today because I'm almost already done and uh, I have lots more to tell you. Um, 
but these are just uh, some of the uh, 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 lignin components that then uh, give rise to some of these uh, small molecule fragments that we just saw in the trace. So this is a, a large-scale pyrolysis device viewed a little bit far away and built by my colleague, uh, Chris Safran. Uh, Chris, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but basically uh, this white tube here that's covered with insulation uh, is a, a pipe in which he's got a, a screw uh, conveyor that uh, squeezes and heats the biomass that is fed from this drum, from this uh, feeder. Uh, uh, as it goes down uh, the pipe and then uh, the vapors that come from that, that pyrolysis process um, are collected and we'll see the collection in just a second. This, uh, this green thing is just the motor, uh, electronics and so forth. And the thing in the back is a lathe. Okay, so um, this is, oh man, I'm sorry about the darkness. I, the, I tried to lighten these pictures up a little bit, but. Will that affect? Uh, I don't think it works on the, that screen. It works on my screen. Uh, oh, really? I didn't know. OK, that's a good thing to know. Anyway, it's not that important. Th this is, these are the collection uh, jars from this particular setup. This is the char trap. These are, this is a closer picture. Here you see some bio oil being collected. This is the gas that's coming off, which actually burns just about as clean as regular old natural gas. Um, one can certainly imagine using it for heat. Uh, um, but this stuff, as it's coming into the jars, the reason it's all white up here is because it looks like smoke, basically. It is something like smoke uh, as it's condensing. And one of the things that, that I think is actually fairly important in what Chris has done and in, uh, in going forward, a huge amount of work has been done with those little teeny pyroprobe uh, devices that I talked about at first, in which just a small number of, uh, of, or of micrograms is uh, pyrolyzed and studied. But in fact, uh, there is no guarantee that the chemistry that happens in that tiny little chamber uh, that's swept out in just a few seconds is going to give you the same collection of products as one gets from a kilogram scale uh, reactor like the one I just showed you. And so these two GC traces, which are not identical, but are really quite similar, uh, are, uh, it's fairly important to make the comparison, which is to show that to a first approximation, the pyroprobe, the micro, and the pyroreactor, the macro uh, uh, pyrolysis on, these, on the switchgrass uh, actually gave rise to essentially identical uh, collections of um, or compositions of uh, mixtures. And you know, here's a whole list of all the assigned uh, compounds for the different peaks. I'm not going to bore you with that. Well, another question that, that we got interested in uh, was uh, we noticed when we started studying um, some of the, first of all, the literature, of course, but also some uh, well-defined uh, single substance uh, studies First of all, just the comparison of simple glucose and cellulose pyrolysis itself does not give exactly the same uh, composition of, of products. These are both things made out of glucose subunits, and you might have thought they should more or less give the same answer. But in fact, what you see is that from the cellulose, you see much more levoglucosan, the anhydride, uh, the, uh, the, this stuff, uh, from uh, loss of water from a glucose molecule. and. Uh, over here, uh, I forgot to put what this is. Uh, I think that's one of the furans. Um, anyway, the, the point is that the composition is by no means uh, uh, the same, although we know that levoglucosan itself survives pyrolysis more or less without reaction. There are a few little blips in the baseline here, but really it comes through the pyrolysis without, uh, without being changed. So there is a lot of work out there. Uh, there are a lot of theoretical studies where people have said, let me study the pyrolysis of glucose but glucose is not biomass, and that's really important. And neither, for that matter, is pure cellulose. And oops, uh, I'm not going to regale you with all of the details of, of analogous studies that we've done where we've looked at cellulose in poplar trees, cellulose mixed with um, actual biomass to ask whether we get um, uh, the same behavior from single systems as, uh, as from mixed systems. But I'll tell you the summary of what we've learned. 
First of all, micro and macro scale pyrolyses do behave similarly. Second, intermolecular chemistry plays a huge role. So if we put uh, uh, poplar and cellulose together, uh, we see products that come from the bits and pieces of those things reacting with each other. No great surprise, this is a very, very high, high gas density, high temperature uh, reaction context. And even if the lifetime in that context is relatively short, it's not going to all be unimolecular chemistry. Uh, we've started to put in carbon-13 labels. Uh, with monomeric sugars, and we show again that uh, those monomeric sugars, even if we dope them into cellulose or poplar, <coughs> those sugars behave uniquely and they don't just sort of fall into the uh, uh, behavior of all the rest of the sugars that came from the cellulose backbone. That's actually quite important because again, there's an awful lot of, uh, of work that more or less assumes uh, that they should behave that way. Um, we have shown that if we look at Arabidopsis tissue culture, these are the tissue cultures, they're called zebra cells. Uh, if, we, if we look at pyrolysis of biomass that we get from this tissue culture, it actually gives essentially the same pyrograms as we get if we pyrolyze stem cuttings from the real plant. So admittedly, this is not a tree, it's not even a famous biomass energy crop, but it is a, a piece of plant matter and we wanted to be able to study the tissue uh, because we want to be able to explicitly incorporate a carbon-13 label into uh, legitimate biomass in, in locations so that we understand and can therefore uh, trace in our pyrolysis studies. So that's where we are on the pyrolysis studies. And uh, we think it's important to actually try to, you know, lay the foundation, the chemical foundation, a little more firmly than it seems to be uh, laid out there. Now we're going to go on to the, to the hydrocarbon uh, upgrading. And, uh, you guys, well, I'm going to jump over a lot of stuff because uh, it's getting late. But I should say, uh, the conventional way, conventional tools that people have developed so far for upgrading of bio oil uh, pretty much look like reduction with molecular hydrogen, uh, more or less classical hydrotreating uh, of the kind that one would use in, um, in a petroleum refinery. But let's just remind ourselves for a second of the categories of just to sort of show you one more time, the categories of molecules that we're, we're going to want to be working on. We're going to want to work on carboxylic acids and aldehydes and ketones. We're going to want to work on uh, sugars, of course. Uh, we're also going to want to work on aromatics and all of those things we want ultimately to reduce uh, because one of the problems that bio oil has is that it, uh, it's reactive and acidic. It tends to uh, not only react with itself and make tars that then can't be moved around, but also it tends to corrode containers that it's in. So it's fairly aggressive stuff. So the first priority in this upgrading business is to uh, diminish its reactivity and its acidity as well as uh, uh, lowering its oxygen content. Um, everybody, no, not everybody, many people have used hydrogen. And I just want to make another comment about hydrogen, which is, that when you see people saying that they're going to solve problems with hydrogen, again, this is probably preaching to the choir, but hydrogen has to be understood as a petrochemical. Hydrogen, if you buy commercial hydrogen today, it's made by reforming of, uh, of methane. And uh, it's, it's essentially always downstream from a fossil source. Yes, uh, we can, of course, talk about electrolytic hydrogen from solar energy. And Im implicitly, that's effectively what we will talk about, but uh, uh, I'd rather not make it explicitly. Okay, so what are we trying to do? We want to ask, can we use electricity as a chemical reagent? And why do we think that that's a promising thing to do? Because even though today, we make, the fact that we make electricity uh, by burning fuels, even that is, uh, it's worth it to know how to transform uh, our organic compounds electrically because the fuels we burn are not liquid fuels. Liquid fuels have a higher practical value for a, an advanced society like ours because they can be used as the building blocks for the, the many products that we talked about and also f as energy dense fuels for uh, cars. You, you can tell I'm a battery skeptic, but I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, we can talk about these traditional sources, but I, of course my, my uh, long-term vision is, my, our hope is that uh, 
uh, solar photovoltaic and other, uh, other uh, alternative carbon neutral sources are going to continue to burgeon and become really the dominant sources. And so by far the fastest growing uh, solar energy capture, or sorry, the fastest growing energy sources are, uh, are coming from solar energy capture schemes of one sort or another that generate electricity. And that's, our, that's why electricity needs to be studied as a chemical reagent. Okay. Um, so that's what I mean by saying it's going to be a primary energy form eventually. Um, the other thing is that uh, right now, energy, uh, electricity is generated in central facilities and distributed, and there are non-trivial losses of electrical power uh, over lines, as well as, um, as well as you know the intrinsic inefficiencies of power plants. And so, uh, the idea of, of generating, uh, capturing uh, solar energy locally, for example, on your farm in Illinois. Um, uh, is uh, appealing if we can also develop the chemistry that allows us to take that locally captured energy and apply it to the reduction and energy upgrading of our bio oil. Um, that's a, sorry, I should have just said this is a reactor that we built. It's a, it's a slightly, it's a pressure compatible electrochemical reactor. What you see in the bottom is basically a uh, catalyst and water mixture, it's kind of a mess. It's not bio oil. Uh, anyway, what about the history of this? Well, um, we actually are, are also interested in particular in making chemicals uh, because as I said at the beginning, one of, the, one of the issues one has to face is how to attract industrial investment. That's less of an issue today than it was 15 years ago, but uh, we still think that uh, one of the most promising directions is to point out where high value chemicals can be made where, whose value doesn't come from the heat that's released when you burn them. And so, uh, so I say we're interested in targeting you know, reaction paths that make higher value things, not just, just heat or uh, fuel substances. Um, we're also interested in making things that are you know, most sort of obviously uh, related to where we started. Uh, although the bio oil gives us a much more diverse collection of starting points than, than uh, what we used to look at. Um, and then we want to ask, you know, what kind of catalysis is going to fit with this type of uh, feedstock? And we've said you can't really vaporize sugar very easily, so we're going to be mostly looking at condensed phase, preferably aqueous reactions. Of course, we'd like it to be as mild as possible and as general as possible. So there's a little bit of history here. This is uh, what Joe was referring to. Uh, I, I've been working with Dennis Miller on transformations like the ones on this slide for years. And uh, this particular collection, I'm not going to certainly regale you with all the chemistry. But I will mention this one over here, the hydrogenation of lactic acid. I like it as an illustration because lactic acid's formula is exactly half the formula of glucose. And fermentation of glucose to lactic acid is a well-established path. And so we thought many years ago, let's, let's see if we can figure out how to take lactic acid uh, in the state that it's born in by fermentation. That is to say, an aqueous solution. Well, actually, lactic acid is hard to not get an aqueous solution. You know why? Because it's a really strong acid, and it's an alcohol, and it's an acid. If you try to remove the water from lactic acid and go act like an organic chemist, you're in trouble because you just it'll catalyze its own esterification, and pretty soon all you have is glue. And so you need, it's not just a matter of trying to be nice to nature and do it the way that, uh, uh, that in, the, in the state it was born in. You got to do it that way because you really can't handle it uh, not in water. Of course, you could make esters and so forth. You could get very elaborate. But we decided to develop a hydrogenation directly in aqueous solution uh, to, uh, to form propylene glycol. Propylene glycol is a pr promising target because it's uh, a large scale commodity chemical and it's a uh, and it's a polyol. I mean, it's a lot like sugars. So this is years ago. This is my friend and colleague, Dennis Miller, who I've been working with for many years. Uh, we looked at uh, lactic acid. We looked at various other carboxylic acids getting reduced to the corresponding alcohols. And we found a nice, clean reaction. And the only thing is, for an organic chemist, it was frightening, because it runs at 1,500 PSI of hydrogen, and it runs at 150 degrees. 150 degrees isn't such a big deal, uh, but 1,500 PSI to an organic chemist sounds frightening. The kind of hydrogenations I had done up to that point were done in glass shakers with maybe an extra half of atmosphere of hydrogen over them. Uh, 
But he says, oh, come on, you know, the Haber process is 4,000 pounds of hydrogen. Uh, it's just a matter of capital investment and, you know, uh, tons of steel. Uh, okay, fine. So we did this for a lot of years. We did lots of reductions of different carboxylic acids and kinetics and, and you know, inhibition studies and stuff like that. We showed that uh, the side chain, the presence of an electron withdrawing side chain helps. The reaction isn't quite as good with propanoic acid, but still perfectly usable. But with amino acids, it's particularly good. It turned out that that uh, uh, gave rise to a bunch of other interesting chemistry, which I will talk about a little bit tomorrow. Uh, you can see the amino acids actually undergo reduction under milder conditions, and they're actually quite interesting. Uh, but I still was worried by that pressure. And so uh, a few years ago, a student who joined my group, uh, Tulika Dalavoy, um, uh, was interested in electrochemistry. And I said, why, don't we, why do we need that high pressure? Well, the reason we need that high pressure is not because it's needed to drive the reaction. It's because hydrogen is a very, very nonpolar molecule, and not very, it's not very soluble in water. And so it's just that we have to cram the hydrogen into the water to get it to the catalyst surface. Our catalyst, which I didn't mention, I apologize, our catalyst was ruthenium on carbon, just heter classic heterogeneous catalyst, 5% ruthenium on carbon. That means little teeny nanoparticles of metal supported on a carbon particle. Um, nothing very special. All we needed to do was get the hydrogen dissolved in the water, delivered to the surface of the hydrogen, where, of the, sorry, of the ruthenium, where it could do its uh, catalytic reduction of uh, the lactic acid. Well, um, so what if we could just hook up the catalytic metal to an electrode and actually form reduced protons at the surface of the metal? That would mean we would actually be making our hydrogen atoms on the surface of the metal, presumably in exactly the form they're needed, they, that, are, that is needed to do the reduction. Um, so it turns out that works. That worked surprisingly well. In fact, it worked at room pressure. But what was even more pleasing, and frankly quite a surprise for me, was that it worked at 70 degrees. We had had to go to 150 degrees when we were un under 1,500 pounds of hydrogen. And now, at room pressure, we also got to come down to below the boiling point. We didn't even need that pressurized electrochemical cell. Uh, and so that was very satisfying. Um, these are sort of the promises. That means we wouldn't have to handle high pressure hydrogen. Uh, we wouldn't have to uh, fight the barrier of getting the hydrogen into the water, et cetera. And um, in order to establish the connection between our classical catalysis and our electrocatalytic reduction, what we actually did was to use the very catalyst that we had uh, used with hydrogen uh, with the so-called reticulated vitreous carbon electrode. This is a uh, a, a thing that looks like a kitchen sponge, only very, very much more uh, you know, fine in terms of the, the uh, fibers in it. Uh, and it. But it's made of, of carbon and therefore is conductive. And it gives one a matrix into which you can embed um, other particles. In our case, we embedded, that's what all this gunk here is, we embedded the uh, ruthenium on carbon particles, the very catalyst we had used for chemical reductions uh, before. And so we verified that we could uh, do that electrocatalytic reduction. And here's a summary of, of what we were able to do there. Um, this is very promising, although at the time I wasn't so focused on it. But we actually had reduced an aromatic ring, uh, more or less, uh, as a byproduct of the uh, carboxylic acid reduction that we, uh, that we accomplished here as well. Um, we looked at mandelic acid first just because we were working at such low concentrations because we were so unsure that anything would happen at all that we wanted to be able to use UV vis to follow things. Uh, but later on, uh, lactic acid, it all worked out fine. One sort of interesting thing was that it turned out that the reduction uh, revealed the presence of lactaldehyde as an intermediate that we had never, ever been able to see in the uh, in the chemical reduction because it was such a mild, running under such mild conditions that we could actually build up a concentration of that intermediate. This stuff's kind of a pain in the butt to make synthetically. So if one actually wanted it, this would be as good a way to make it as any. But now Tulika has long graduated. And I have two other students who are um, actively uh, trying to develop this. And because it's uh, 5 o'clock, I'm not going to go into lots and lots of their results. But I will simply say that they're 
their goal is to go forward with this electrocatalytic set of uh, strategies, uh, recognizing a couple of challenges. One is, of course, we want our electrocatalyst to, to last forever. We want to use cheap metals because the real vision would be to, for the farmer to gather biomass and have what amounts to a combine that's uh, you know, got a little extra furnace on it and makes the bio oil right then and there. The farmer comes back from the field with a, uh, you know, a, a, a bin full of corn or whatever it is and a tub full of bio oil, plops it in the dairy barn, pulls out the electrodes, sticks them in the tub, and transforms it into biodiesel, or not biodiesel, but just diesel oid stuff. That would be the, you know, of course, the, the most uh, wonderful vision. Uh, that means everything has to be cheap, and so electrodes ideally should be things like this. The elect electrodes we've talked about so far are all ruthenium, and I uh, have to confess today that so far most of our good results still have come from ruthenium. But where do we have to go further? What we have to do to go further is simply to say um, two things. The, uh, the counter electrode typically has been a, a sacrificial anode. Uh, and that's a little bit of a problem if one wants to uh, run the reaction for a long time. Uh, so we've been looking into Dan Nocera's cobalt phosphate surface uh, electrode that, uh, that does water splitting. That'll generate protons, uh, which ultimately will be the, uh, the uh, reagents that protonate our reduced uh, uh, products on the cathode side. Um, so the other thing is that we don't want to do this uh, ruthenium on carbon powder anymore. That was important for establishing the relationship between our old catalysis and our electrocatalysis. But today we want electrodes that make that are you know a more monolithic, more uh, straightforward thing to handle than a powder you're stirring around in your mixture. So the carbon cloth is. Uh, is what we've been using. I'm going to, you know what, it's so late. I'm, I'm going to skip over the majority of these things. You're going to, please forgive me. I'm going to go to uh, the very end of this story because I, I was overly optimistic in all the things I wanted to tell you about. I'm sure you don't really need to see micrographs of carbon electrodes. Um, although here is one. <laughs> oh, darn it. It's, not, it's too dark. Well, anyway, we are showing that we can plate, you know, different metals onto these various grids and get, you know, what really looks like quite a, quite a uh, properly uh, rich surface area. Uh, this happens to be a nickel surface, uh, and we've been experimenting with uh, trying to make things that are going to be both durable and, uh, and uh, easy to uh, prepare. Um, but I, I will simply say it in words, I guess. Um, well, no, here it is. So the, one of the challenging substrates, that, one of the things I thought was going to be most challenging was reducing the things that come from lignans. I actually thought that was going to be harder than reducing the carboxylic acids. It turns out we can reduce phenol to cyclohexanones and cyclohexanols very straightforwardly. We can reduce uh, similarly guaiacol here, the methoxy uh, uh, phenol to uh, both uh, cyclohexanol and methoxy cyclohexanols. These are low yields that we got the first time. Um, uh, oh, whoops, I, I skipped over the ruthenium stuff. Well, anyway, I'll tell you simply that, you know, these yields have now, this was the, the first time we did it, these yields have now come up to the 80s. Uh, and what's interesting is we're actually deoxygenating as we're, we're making cyclohexanol as well as methoxycyclohexanols uh, in these reactions. This, this, is, uh, this was from a nickel reaction. Our, our ruthenium is uh, better here. We also have started using these kinds of reductions as a high school student uh, projects to kind of get kids involved in the overall challenge. Everybody's worked with batteries. And so we've shown that if you just <laughs> use the nickel surface of a quarter, if you use American coins as, uh, that's the honors option, if you use American coins as your uh, catalytic surface, you can make these, uh, these reductions happen uh, with uh, simple substrates like, like phenol or uh, ketones um, just just clamping these things together between an insulated pair of, uh, of um, you know, paper clip type clamps and, uh, and do biomass relevant transformations. This is from a high school students, or sorry, an undergraduate's 
study of whether penny, nickel, or quarter were better electrodes. You can see they were all more or less the same. But anyway, that was the story. In that case, we were reducing acetophenone, but that was the story. Anyway, that's where we are. There's a, there's a lot of electrocatalytic chemistry I think is very, very important to develop, and we're, we're working toward it. I'm sorry I had to skip over a lot of it, but I hope that uh, this wasn't too, too much of the old hat messages you're used to. So here's my message. Biomass uh, fast pyrolysis is what I think is the right way to go into a general uh, digestive system for biomass to fuels. Um, I think it has the potential to actually displace as much as 50% of uh, US petroleum. And if we were able to uh, really be efficient with the energy upgrading even somewhat more. Uh, the economics, I think, will be assisted by being able to localize, being able to uh, find uh, technologies that are simple enough to be implemented in, on a local basis so one doesn't have to truck biomass across the country. Uh, and then, uh, of course, also, if we can figure out how to pull out higher value products, things that are chemical products, not just fuels, that would also enhance the value of the effort. So thanks for listening, and I apologize for going over a bit. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Are there lights here? Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. What sort of uh, energy in the electrical part of the system does it take? Uh, what's the energy return on the energy? Good question. Um, that uh, our, our, both our current efficiencies and our voltage, uh, you know, our, our uh, uh, yeah, voltage levels, our, our actual numbers of watts are, are uh, critical issues. And right now, they're not very good. But given that I'm starting with 10 times what I get when I store the chemical energy in plants, I've been pretty liberal about that, which is not to say that it's, it's not a concern or not a, a focus of our work. But right now, for example, the best current efficiencies we've seen are on the order of 50%. And our overvoltages are uh, not as much as a factor of two, but about a volt over. Uh, that still beats a factor of 10 by a significant margin, uh, which doesn't mean that I don't care. <laughs> but it means that I'm willing to start here. <laughs> but that, of course, is the critical question in the long run, or one of the critical questions. Yeah. Oh, I think uh, I, I might have missed the, like, the, uh, uh, some of the points you pointed out about like, what, what was the motivation for like, uh, converting the lactic acid to like, a porphyrin glycol? Because like, the lactic acid, I think the people are making polylactic, <coughs> like the plastic, like, or the biodegradable like, plastic or something. And then compared to that, like, what was the motivation to like, do this, like, port, like make that one by extra-hydrolysis to a propane glycol? Well, what happened uh, when we started on that project was that uh, Cargill had just uh, come up with, had, had just uh, formed this uh, collaboration with Dow, and they really had hugely uh, built up their capacity for lactic acid production. And at that time, the uh, fiber, the you know polylactide fiber, wasn't, although that was, that's the market, market that they were targeting, because it's such, if, in case people don't know, polylactide is a, uh, makes a fiber that is a very, uh, and, or a plastic that you can use to make biodegradable bottles, but also it's used for um, things like surgical su sutures. And in those days, it was more kind of those specialty applications that were the driving force. And so they were very high value applications. It turned out, first of all, the, the polymerization chemistry wasn't as clean as they thought it was going to be. So their ability to scale their production didn't come up quite as quickly as they had hoped. And also, they had created enough capacity that it was worth it to ask the question, you know, how would, what would we do if lactic acid could be viewed as a feedstock? It's still pretty cheap. And at that time, also, people hadn't identified the paths, uh, which we and others have worked on, uh, for taking, for example, uh, leftover glycerol from what is now, you know, considered to be a side stream from biodiesel, like you and I were talking about earlier. Um, to make propylene glycol. Um, and so propylene glycol's position in that overall set of markets has changed a bit. 
But that's a very good question. Today, you probably, it's worth it to know how, but it's probably not something that would be one, uh, a path one would choose given that there are now methods of making propylene glycol from glycerol. Uh, so, like, uh, just by looking at just the, the, the GC um, results of the bio oil, like, it seems like a lot of the acidic acid seems Mm -hmm. Or like the, like maybe like it might be the you know the, the primary cause of the acidity or um, so do you have like like I think acetic acid itself like can be used like I guess like can argue that like do you have any idea of like making acetic acid do something else so this yes yeah well of course our we we think that our chem our reduction chem well we know our reduction chemistry is perfectly capable of reducing acetic acid to to ethanol do we want to do that well I don't know. Uh, but one of the obvious things that, that one can do, and I haven't talked about it, but certainly out of these, the large-scale pyrolysis scheme, it's easy to fractionate things. You've already got it hot, and essentially coupling it to what amounts to a distillation column is a pretty straightforward thing to do. And so if you want to fractionate, uh, for example, to pull out the lighter fractions like, like acetic acid, that's a fairly straightforward thing to do. Is it worth the effort to clean it up a lot? It depends somewhat. I didn't talk about species specificity, but different plants have different uh, levels of acetylation and so forth, and, so, and therefore different yields of acetic acid. I'm not sure if, I don't know. I, I don't know the prices of acetic acid well enough to be able to comment on that at all in terms of whether it's economically reasonable. Any other questions? Well, well, thank you for listening. Thanks. Uh